And that's the secret to eternal life. <gasps> Mr. Berger, how are you? I was worried that there wouldn't be anybody here that I knew. Okay, so we're here to talk about uh, augmented reality and mixed reality used in advertising and brands. Uh, you'll notice that VR dropped off of this. This used to be the VR and AR. We've added mixed reality and removed VR. And interestingly enough, this morning, I don't know how many of you saw that uh, Jaunt stopped doing VR this morning to concentrate on AR. So it's a very timely day. So what I'd like to do, half the panelists I, I know, and the other half we never connected. So I'm sure that the gentleman at the end there is scared, like, what are we doing here? <laughs> do you know what we're doing here? I do, yes. Vaguely. So what I'd like to do is have everybody start out uh, who you are, what you currently do, and what was your first job in digital? How did you get started? How did, did you quit medical school? What did you do to end up here today? And do you miss it? So go ahead, you go first. Sure, uh, so my name's Anthony Borquez. I uh, run a studio out here called Grab Games. We're in Santa Monica. We do um, mixed reality, I guess you'll, you'll say now. So we've started off with VR. We have a few products in the VR markets today across the majority of the platforms, headset and mobile. And uh, we're also uh, doing a lot of work in AR as well. Our studio's mixed. Uh, we just did a launch title for Magic Leap that showed last week at LeapCon. And we have three other Magic Leap projects that we're actively working on. Uh, my first job, I, I, my first job, I guess I was, I graduated from USC in 94 and I taught one of our first internet classes like right after. So I've been a professor there for like 25 years. Very cool. So, yeah. Thanks. Next up. I am Kati Halonen, CC of AI Video Booth. And we are doing this augmented reality videos, video marketing, with our own sideboard camera. We have our firmware and our own software. And we're doing putting people inside of the story. And that's why we have this camera has this third person view. And it's a viral video marketing without a viral video, because we are shooting so many people that they're sharing their own videos via their own social media channels. So the ads, the company's message, the brand story will get viral, even the one video say, say, has 50 or 100 or 200 viewers. But we're making so many videos, so it's actually the campaign is viral. And I have my master's thesis in technical university, but I'm, all my working life I've been working in marketing. So I think I've digitalized since the first time I have my, then my employee made websites. But now we are doing this AR marketing. Okay. Uh, my name is Natasha French. I'm the CMO of Ventana. Uh, we're a mixed reality company who have built a software platform to enable brands, companies to upload their own content, and then we can push it out through um, any display. So we started off six years ago in the entertainment space doing holograms with DJs um, and quickly moved forward since they don't have much money to realize that the brands wanted to use that. And instead of making it just kind of one of those one-off moments, we added the interactive component. So allowing people in real time without the need of a headset, without the need of any green screen to see themselves a hologram in real time, and then using facial recognition we track all of the user data, gender, age range, sentiment. So we're allowing brands to increase lead gen, revenue. Um, in addition to that, once they do the experience, you get a shareable takeaway that you can post on any channel automatically. So we're creating real-time content that people can share as well. Some of our clients include Nike, Adidas. Um, we do a lot in the retail space, uh, Microsoft Intel. First job in the digital space, I used to actually be a journalist for CNN covering international news gathering. Very cool. Very cool. My name is Mark. that, Mark. Uh, I, don't, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be leaving. Thank you. Um, my name is Mark Netter. Um, I currently work at Warner Brothers Digital Networks on DC Universe, uh, working on marketing of original content. Where if, if you look in the program, you'll see that I, uh, up until recently, was working at Revolve Agency, where we actually develop, it's an entertainment ad agency, where we actually develop both VR and AR advertising products, um, which are you know pretty unique, and I think kind of speak to one way that um, of 
using this new technology in a way that doesn't require special equipment. Uh, my first job in digital was working at a video game company uh, in San Francisco uh, where we were shooting actors and rotoscoping them and putting them into a, at that time, cutting edge game called The Last Express. Um, the game was designed, I don't, I don't know if anyone's a Prince of Persia fan out there, but the designer, uh, Jordan Mechner, was a creator of Prince of Persia, a good friend of mine who had brought me in on the project and sucked me into the digital world for, uh, got me started in that way. Cool. Very good. Uh, my name is Ted Cohen. I run a uh, consulting firm, digital entertainment, called Tag Strategic. This is my 82, I can't do the math, 92, 2002, 2002. This is my 36th year in digital, something like that. Uh, the first 20 were kind of quiet. The last 12 or 15 have been fairly interesting. Uh, how many of you have been to a panel before? Oh, by the way, we have to get this out of the way. You've succeeded in calling me on every panel I've done this week. <laughs> Bye. Talk to you later. That's my girlfriend, Maggie. She knows I'm on stage. <laughs> she knows it. I gave her a schedule today. I will be on stage at 3.30. She called on Facebook. I didn't answer. She did it yesterday at UCLA. I held up. I, we did a video shoot. Anyway, sorry about that. Okay, how many of you have been to a panel that I've moderated before? And yet you come back. It always amazes me. So here are the rules. You're here because... This is more interesting to you than something that's going on in another room, because these people are brilliant, because every once in a while I ask a somewhat decent question. But if you leave here today not finding out what you came here for, they're buying drinks for us later. Um, it's because you didn't ask a question. So we're not going to do questions at the end. If, uh, if Mark says something or Natasha says something that you piques your interest but you're not sure, raise your hand. We will call on you right away. Uh, we want you to leave here very happy today and saying nice things at the cocktail party. So, um, first question, who went to the LeapCon last week? You did, obviously. Yes. Anybody else on the panel go to LeapCon? Nope. Anyone in the audience go to LeapCon? So, what's the takeaway? Is it real? Does it work? Yes. Is it worth $20 billion? <laughs> no. <laughs> yes? Well, you want it to be. You left with options. <laughs> really? <laughs> Say nice things. He wants it to be even bigger. No, was it, did it meet, for people who weren't working on a game when you saw it for the first time, was it, did it live up to your expectations? Yes? It was what you expected. Okay, was it worth, it's worth waiting for? So compare and contrast, Hollow Leap and Magic, and, uh, Hollow Lens and Magic Leap. Sorry about that. Hollow Leap. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't sleep much last night. It does a few things that Hollow Lens doesn't do. It's, it's got some nice features. Yeah, it's good. Very cool. So as I said at the beginning, uh, Jaunt announced this morning they were no longer spending money on VR. They're moving over to AR and mixed reality. <laughs> What do you believe, what, open question, anybody can jump in first. What do you believe the future of VR is? is are, have we gone through another VR has peaked, we'll come back to it later, or is, is it still going to continue to grow? Mark. I always think the, the issue with VR is, can you hear me? Yes. Am I going through this? Okay, I, to me the issue with VR is always the additional equipment. And I think the reason why AR has is leapfrogging so to speak is because of the fact that you can use it on your phone that we already have the device that we've done the last mile already i think the other big issue with vr is the idea of sensory depth you know that um you know if you're watching television you can eat a sandwich if you're using vr you can eat a sandwich because you'll smash your face with the <laughs> You'll have chicken salad on your face. It'll be really bad. Um, and I think that you know, the shared experience is also kind of a different thing. Now, I do think there are special uses of VR, and the only question that I have is about scale um, and whether or not that's important. I think that there's high VR, what I would call like big VR, which is Oculus, which is you know lots of money behind it. And I think that there's also you know commercial uses, PR uses, um, I know you know one small company uh, that I really love called uh, Well Played 
uh, studios, which makes games, and it's a small group of, a core group of guys who actually went to high school together and are brilliant, and then they bring in other people as they need it, and they have no shortage of contract work right now for major corporations and all kinds of folks, and they're raising their rates, and you know, hopefully they'll actually be able to start saving some money soon and all that kind of stuff. So I think that those things are, are possible. I think that in the gaming space, I think there's very potential use for VR. I don't personally want to be in a VR experience for two hours, but you know, I've had experiences that are like 10, 15 minutes that are you know, pretty impressive and mind-blowing. Um, so VR? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, a few. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, I think there's two things that VR does really. I think there's two things that VR can do, right? One of them is what I would call sort of the more gamey aspect of it, or the more the ride aspect of it. Like, oh my God, that blew my mind. My senses were blown by that whole thing. And and you know, there are different forms of VR, right? There's 360 video. There's immersive VR. There's you know whatever. And there's issues with all of them. But the other thing that it can do is it can bring you into empathy because of the fact that your senses are all controlled. Um, there's a really simple 360 video VR experience that I had after the, um, uh, in France, in Paris, when, when the, 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 the uh, magazine was attacked and, you know, all the cartoonists were killed, you know, and, and then they, there was a vigil for like a day or two outside in Paris. And somebody had put together a VR ex uh, 360 video experience of being at the vigil and kind of dissolving over the course of the day. And I was moved by the experience. And I was moved more than I might have been just watching a movie. Other thoughts? Uh, I think VR is very good in gaming, especially when we have haptics there. But in and maintenance, industrial, educational VR, I think there's, there's very good market there. But in marketing, I think there's in a few years, there's no VR or AR, only MR. Um, I'll, I'll give some uh, examples that, that we've seen so far. Um, thinking about two, two products that we launched, two games that we launched, one of them uh, is profitable, one isn't. And uh, it's, I think it's primarily because when they launched. And we have a 30-person team with a, a AAA in terms of like salaries and whatnot, so we have to make millions of dollars on a game to break even. So. Um, we had one game that we launched, it didn't break even, uh, didn't come close. Uh, we had another game that did. And I think part of it was, when you start thinking about VR, you start with a big, wide audience, you group in 360 video people and um, experimental content, and then you go into premium content that costs 10 bucks to 40 bucks. You know, our games typically cost $29. Mm -hmm. um, but what we learned is we started to kind of condense our audience and really kind of find who our consumer was. It's not a big audience, it's small, but if you, if you reach them the right way, you could sell half a million, a million copies of a game. Mm. Yeah, but you gotta, you, you gotta know where they're at and you gotta reach them the right way. And there is a profitable business there. Um, the other thing that we learned um, was the location-based market is pretty big, like massively big in terms of what we thought we would VR, VR arcade? VR, yeah, VR, VR arcade. arcade. So like even China, you could get with the right distributor, you could get into 800 centers. I think getting money out might be a little bit more challenging, but <laughs> right. um, but it's we were blown away. 10x we were seeing compared to normal uh, direct sales that we were seeing in, in different stores. So uh, that was something that we didn't quite realize. I think in the long term, a lot of people are thinking. Maybe there's a convergence of AR and VR in some way, shape, or form. Um, if you look at the Vive Focus, it has a pass-through camera, so it has AR functionality that you could turn on. Right. The, the, the Lenovo Mirage with Google, that actually has a pass-through AR mode as well. I mean, it's still big and clunky, but at some point, if we have um, like this kind of experience, you know, like a pair of glasses, and this is like the equivalent of the Magic Leap Pod, where this is kind of powering this. I think this works. I think this could be yeah. Yeah. amazing to go VR, AR, whatever you like. Yeah. And touching on what um, kind of everyone said here is, you know, last year you said this panel was called VR, AR. Now it's AR, MR. I spoke on a panel last week called AR, XR. So, you know, and so it's like, what is that? Everything else kind of in there. So I think it kind of goes to touch where, 
You know, we built our hardware because there wasn't anything out there to enable you to experience those interactive holograms. But now, you know, as we become display agnostic, it's all about the software and the content. So enabling other people to use existing content. I think when you're looking at the scheme of it, we've worked with VR companies who had a VR. My favorite story is they were at South by from um, launching a VR movie about the Hubble telescope. Well, they wanted to attract people waiting in line, but they couldn't have everyone put a headset on. So they actually used one of our displays to push out the experience. So then people were attracted. They saw a holographic Hubble telescope, and then they got in line to watch the movie. So I think with the different industries, I think there's like for the gaming, for medical training. You know, I've worked with a lot of on the healthcare side. Is um, obviously you can't have training where you're wearing it and there's a patient in front of you, but maybe you know you're training uh, an attendee or a resident where they can experience what that doctor just saw while doing that experience. But then again, like maybe being able to use that content elsewhere or making that content accessible across different platforms. So I definitely think on a industry basis it's changing in terms of where VR like I fell VR skiing so like a you know a VR and I sometimes don't get along but then again it's more of that group experience and I think it kind of goes down to us as consumers wanting to be a part of it together and as a whole and VR takes you away from it but for some industries it can still make sense for it so talk a little bit about the launch titles for for Magic Leap in terms sure. of what are they and what are the experiences and from, I mean, you know, the coming out party for AR was primarily Pokemon Go. Right. Um, and so where do we go after that? So I think the first batch of content uh, that they rolled out was, uh, is a program called Screens. And the easiest thing to do with, within Magic Leap is uh, they'll give you an API and it's relatively, it's not that difficult to be able to put up these screens. So you got your headset on. Actually, I brought my Magic Leap too. I was giving demos <laughs> earlier today, so. You have it with you? Yeah, yeah. You wanna pass it around? Nobody will hurt it. <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure, seriously. Yeah, okay. Um, so this, this concept. I've, had good, I've passed equipment around for years. Everything came back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it was Philip CDI, but uh, never mind. It was, that was um, a joke for Gary. <laughs> well, first, so the, this, the screens platform, like if, you, um, if you're like the NBA, HBO, whatever uh, like content you have that has a streaming feed, it's very easy. You could get this content up and running in a few months. Now that the SDKs have been matured, uh, so what we did is we launched an experience where you could watch uh, like NBA perspectives of games directly through screens. Um, and then we we had a little bit of extra time, so we built a tabletop. So we'll we'll find a surface, and then we built a 3D model of uh, like Cleveland. Cavalier Stadium or the Golden State Warrior Stadium. And then we had players like in real time, 3D models like in sync with the, the live broadcast. Uh, so it's kind of a vision of how in the future, right. you might be at work working on stuff and you might want to watch a game and you can just place it right here in your periphery and be able to like watch part of a game. And, and so our whole thing is trying to do it live. That's what we're most excited about. Smart. A lot of the content, though, was screens-based, and then we saw a game got announced. One of the first games got announced there as well. So, yeah. Mark, you want to talk about DC Universe a bit? I keep getting Facebook. <laughs> I keep getting Facebook ads. Well, it doesn't have much to do right now with uh, with uh, with VR. But what's interesting is that Warner Brothers has a huge investment in Magic Leap. So I already have people coming to me saying, like, "Hey, we should be doing something together with you know with with uh, DCU and, and Magic Leap. DCU is the DC Universe. It's a it's a new streaming. I could do a little plug for it. Yeah. It's um, really a fan focused streaming service that uh, it's more than just a streaming service. It allows you to watch shows, including the new Titans series, which uh, there's an episode a week every Friday, starting last Friday. The, um, it allows you to read comics from a really well curated collection. It allows you to buy some really cool merch and to um, engage with the community. And it also has an encyclopedia of DC characters. And I think it kind of, you know, if it has anything to do with what we're talking about here, it really has to do with the idea of finding your fans and finding your niche and servicing them. We, um, there's a certain degree to which you can't always compete against the big guys by trying to be another big guy. I mean, there's already Netflix, Amazon, and, and Hulu, and I don't see anyone right now breaking into that completely. I think that Disney will be successful to some degree because families, 
Warner has announced its own streaming service next year. It'll be interesting to see how that all plays out. Um, but you know, I also think that when you're talking about these kinds of new technologies, um, you know, the real question is who are the early adopters and what are their reasons for adopting it? Um, and sort of going back to the VR question, it really is sort of, that's why gaming makes sense and that's, you know, there's other sort of early adopters that we all kind of know about out there in these areas. Um, I'm as you look at as you look at your the potential for DC Universe and uh -huh. engage the fans, it would seem that AR or mixed reality extensions well, would keep people engaged. Oh yeah, I mean I've seen I've seen AR uh, applications where you can be in the room with a, a character and you can take pictures with them, you can take video with them. They will pass behind you. Um, it will recognize kind of the space that you're in. Uh, I think that the, there's, a, there's a big future there in terms of that kind of entertainment. So, yes, Gary. Uh, Anthony, uh, yep. I'm curious. I've I, I long thought that uh, people that own experiences, if you have the right experience, you have a great leg up on the VR world. Are you looking at the experiments that are going on with being able to have a virtual court size seat in an NBA game, for example, in real time VR, that kind of thing? Um, so, yes, um, maybe not from the perspective of the seat, like not like like you're all in these different seats, but more so uh, imagine if like the cameras were in the rafters of the stadium and the cameras are now collecting data of where the ball is, where the players are, ball trajectory into the net, and then being able to recreate that. All that data, you can now recreate something in real time. Real time? Real time, yeah. So right now the tests that we've done have been not in real time just because the point cloud data is like terabytes a second and I'm not sure what could stream that. Um, but we had a, we've done stuff where we could compress it down to like 300 megs and it's actually playable in headset and it looks phenomenal. But I'd say we're maybe a, year, a couple years out from that but it is, it, it could happen. We've Probably the most exciting thing I've ever seen in AR is that. What's the user experience from that? So you're saying like it's not like sitting in a seat. You're saying cameras in the rafters, all the game data is recorded. You're going to recreate it, and I can float it around like in a video game. Like so it would be more in the vision that we see is more of like a tabletop where oh. you place it here, and then you now have everything real time acting out. So like an ESPN, if you watch like a game tracker, and you'll see like the football here, and then it moves 10 yards, third and 10. In this case, it would be all the players on the field moving in real time right here in front of you. Like chess? So like kind of like chess, chess, yes, just like chess. Can you, yeah. change you, could, you, could, you could actually go into the field if you wanted to, and you'd be like courtside like this. Because you just, just like a, a cheap seat. Why, why wouldn't you do that right. with a real game? Because you can do that with Canada Town. You have that perspective that you're in the game. Well, so the problem would be... Um, Right now, like what you see is like a 2D video image. We're talking about volumetric captured, right. like real time. So real time avatars that you would just play. Like it's not stuff we would recreate, but imagine like a vol cap, like a camera that's capturing depth and live motion of people in real time to be able to take that model and have like a one second delay and make it live. So imagine the next Floyd Mayweather Pacquiao fight, whatever it is. <laughs> or I hear he might Can't fight wait. the other guy now. So um, I think the one, the two seconds wouldn't mind at that point. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but, but is that something where you're enough. very good? I have a question though. Does that mean that you're interpolating a ton of data in order to be able to make that work? Because you don't have every image recorded, every angle recorded. So with... Um, the next generation cameras. You mean like doing the tweens? Is that what you mean? Yeah, basically in betweening, like on the right. fly, like in crazy numbers. So there's cameras right now, like that they're all working with, that can do a, that can do real time Stitch. volumetric yeah. scan. Right. It's point cloud data, so you you might not be able to see like the exact details of everything, but in terms of body movement, motion, moving around, you could see that. So if you're looking at that top down. This isn't like recreated models. This is live point cloud data of actual people moving. Right. But it's massive. The, the file sizes are massive. That has to get condensed, but it's it's pretty impressive. Like it looks really good. So it's like uh, uh, 
Um, yeah, so imagine like 360 video camera, but with like 3D models and, you know, volumetrically scanned data. Yeah. Yeah. You have to have cameras in the, yeah. in the By the way, Natasha, if you guys haven't seen their stuff, I mean, it's incredible. Like, they're over in, like... Uh, Just down the street, yeah. What's well, yeah. interesting what you guys are saying, because what we've been focusing on is still that group experience. So, yeah. without having any headset on, I think we're on the advertising end, how that's been beneficial for us. And thank you. It was great to have you guys <laughs> by. That's very yeah. uh, nice of you to say. Um, we believe in kind of, and what we know, like example, working with sports teams. So you can actually go to a Clippers game and you can spin a bas hologram basketball on your finger while holding a beer at the same time or drinking that beer. And so what we're big believers in is putting the people, not taking them out of that group experience and putting them in their environment so your friends could be a part of that. And then if they'd like, because nothing happens unless it's shared, can share it on social and what we've also noticed is not sure if you all heard but um the goldfish has a longer attention span than us they are at nine seconds we are at eight seconds and so when you're talking about customer journeys and how you can actually capture that customer in that eight seconds if not less you need to have that moment that wow effect that's visually accessible there and they don't have to put something on so i think when it's kind of taking it, what we've worked on really is having that wow effect when you walk into a room, but then placing that consumer in that experience as well. Um, like, well, you know, with our technology, if you like eventually we built that software so you can upload the content and push it out to a magic leap, you can push it out to different platforms. But if you're using our specific displays, you actually can see it in that live environment. So we were able to put a hologram of Nike launched all their new uniforms for the high school teams in Dallas. The kids walked into the Dallas stadium, the new star where they train, the Cowboys train, and their new uniforms popped up out of the floor as a hologram. I mean, every kid was on Snap and just like cheering. So Whoa. it makes that emotional, empathetic experience, but real, and then you can be next with your buddy being like, oh my God, you know, this is really happening. Well, I think that's the biggest challenge we have between VR and AR. I mean, I, I said, Mark and I were talking downstairs. Uh, I've had a vibe system at home for two years. We don't use it anymore because other than somebody coming over who's never seen it before, it's one person at a time and there's five other people sitting in the room going, am I next? And it's not, or, you know, and we're putting it up on a 12 foot screen so you can at least see what they're seeing, but you're sitting there twiddling your thumbs, you know, where AR is much more, uh, Joel, it's much more, you know, uh, community. So those kind of things are great. I mean, Gary, I just want to do a little shout out. So what you did with video golf, that was the first time that was ever done. So you're talking about basketball. Gary, when we were at Phillips doing CDI years ago, you were controlling a video character and you were playing golf. And it basically measured your backswing, your front swing. You could slice, you could hook. I mean, what was... This has obviously come a long way from that, but we're talking about similar concepts, correct? Well, it's a nightmare to make, but, <laughs> similar. but you had unlimited budget. <laughs> <laughs> I, think what, I think what we experienced, so we did the first live action game ever done. We did the first 3D cell animated game ever done. Mm -hmm. Where we were, is what you were saying, what resonated with me is you figured out Mm -hmm. made something and threw it out there for the world. We accidentally did the same thing. We didn't have any idea what we were doing, but we accidentally did the same thing. That title that Ted just mentioned actually sold 200% of the installed base. I have no idea how that happened. Right. They're going to say, how did you do that? I didn't have any idea. <laughs> we just cashed the real each other. <laughs> <laughs> It was, it was a challenge. Yes, you had a question. You yeah, had a question. Question. So uh, I was talking to someone earlier. Actually, it was at the uh, Oculus Developers Conference a couple weeks ago, and something that came up was that the glass technology required for a lot of these AR glass experiences is still about 10 years away. So as it comes from like the, that, again, no, that uh, they were saying that the technology required for the wearable glass AR experience 
is still about 10 years away. You need to look at ODG and, and, and look at the new OTT devices because they're, they're, they're blunt, you guys all know with their devices, I'm sure, but they're blending AR and VR in fascinating ways with something that's not much more intrusive than those. Okay. Well, I'll take your word for it. I haven't seen it. Um, and I do I believe you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I only bring that up as a whisper there. As a programmer and developer who's got to think about these different mediums, you know, it's one thing to have three different Oculus sets that I can know that these things exist. Right. And holograms, these holograms that you talk about, I know are like a, a destination we all want to get to. But, you know, magically, all the respect, in the past four years, it's kind of been like, oh, is this thing for real? So I'm wondering, like, what is the cost and benefit to to go in on a programming point of view, to go in on trying to create for these mediums that don't really, we, well, some of us know, but some of us <laughs> don't know when they'll exist or how much they'll cost. <laughs> Well, I, I think there, there's like a lane for everything. Um, we take a look at AR agnostically. So we, when we're, we have this one experience right now that uh, we're, we're really focused on being able to watch a live esports match where we've kind of recreated a, a level of a game and we got all the live game data and then we're able to put that on a tabletop and you could watch from your own camera perspective <coughs> an eSports match where you're, you're not seeing what YouTube or Twitch is showing you, but you get to see what you want to see and you're moving around a map. Um, so that's, that works on this device right now. It works on a mobile phone. I could find a surface. I could watch something like this. Like you, you could watch any live event. The equivalent we have in Magic Leap, you put the headset on and then you could be in the level now. I don't have to, you're not going to do this for two hours. That might get a little cumbersome, maybe five minutes as a replay or something. But two hours, no one, I think, wants to do that. With Magic Leap, you have a totem, or you could use hand gestures. You didn't even need the totem. You could actually move around and do things like this. So what's the battery like on that? On this? No, no, your Magic Leap set. Um, the four, four or five hours. Yeah. It seems to me that from the location-based marketing perspective of AR, mobility is key. Key. So yeah. if I'm not if I'm tethered to a PC or something, I understand like oh that could be cool. But if I want to develop an experience for glass, um, is it worthwhile for me to do in the next two and a half years if it's going to require someone to be able to walk to the mall? So I, I, yeah. oh, oh, ahead, I was just going to kind of really going off what you were saying, um, Anthony is. So really, it's about who your audience like. So if you're going to develop something, is it for a marketing advertising reason? So like when I we talk to clients, my first question before we start talking about any development is why are you using augmented reality, more specifically holographic displays? Um, if it's just for wow, you know, let's create content that that's wow. If it's because it's lead generation, we need to create an experience, whether that's at a baseball game, whether that's, you know, as you mentioned, in retail, whether that's, you know, at an event like this, that people are going to stop what they're doing, put in their name, email, zip code, right? So they're, the, the brand's collecting the data, and then that person, if we know it's males between the ages of 25 and 35, we're going to gamify that experience, so they want to come back and do more. If it's for healthcare and for training, you know, we might recommend our AI hologram, where it becomes, we can take any chatbot, add a face to it, and boom, it becomes an interactive AI hologram that can collect data on the users, but can, you know, act as that concierge for them. So <coughs> display, one example I'll give you is we have a car configurator. So we can take any 3D model um, and take that car, drop it into our car configurator platform, and with that car configurator platform, it enables the person to pick the colors, you know, whether it's exterior or interior. They can break it apart. They can build the car. They can spin it around. Um, that can be done on one of our displays. We're right now pushing out onto an iPad app for a client. We also now have a touchscreen display, so you could do that experience on the touchscreen, where the whole point of all of that, we're actually using it for training for lead gen for that client a different medium is when you're creating the content is what is that medium it's going to be pushed out on right who is that the, the, the end user and what is kind of the goal of the experience so like as we're developing right now we don't have an open api but as we grow you know we want people to be able to push up content and then it's automated whether it's our product explorer or car configure so i think where 
the industry's at, you know, it's getting there where there's obviously specific things, but we've gotten a lot further than like six years ago, right? Everything was custom. And I think what we're trying to get away from and when you'll see more content out there is when it's not custom. Like when Google Glass came out, right? Probably people don't even think about that anymore. Is, you know, what is that experience? And I don't think that, you know, everyone, VR came out, everyone thought a headset was going to be bought immediately and it wasn't because of the cost. And I think the same with HoloLens. So I think it's once we're be able to create this place to create the content and then it can be pushed out in different displays or devices dependent on what the goal of using those different content devices are. I agree because uh, it's not about the platform, it's about the content. Mm -hmm. what, do, what do people want to have and what the customer want to have and what's the aim of this all this campaign or game or whatever because if it has good content nobody will use it. <laughs> so I say it's, it's content isn't king, content is everything. Yeah. So, but I mean, to, his, to, his, to his question, I would say go all in right now. Right. Like I'd say now, <laughs> three years ago with maybe just hollow in the marketplace mm -hmm. and um, what else? I mean, there wasn't much out at the time. Yeah. It was a little risky. Magic Leap is available now. iOS and Android, ARKid AR Core, yeah. 600 right. million addressable devices right now. Um, and Pokemon Go, a top game grossing. A, Keep an eye out for the Ghostbusters game coming out just before Halloween. That is going to be, I think, the first AR mobile experience that actually will like nail monetization because they took a look at all the top grossing games and right. built a mechanic and a core game loop to monetize. That'll be a, a top grossing game. And you know, Apple's coming out soon. At some point, hopefully in two years, once they release their device, then I think you may be in a, a great position to, to succeed with all that, that opportunity. I mean, you always want to create something that has the ability to port it to another platform. But one of the biggest philosophical things we've run into over the years, and I'd love to hear your opinion, is there seems to be a philosophical divide between a common experience of the same program across five different platforms versus the program performing to its best ability on a particular platform. So in some cases, dumbing a program down so that whether you pick up a PlayStation, an Xbox, at the time a CDI player, whatever, that it was the same exact experience where each of those platforms actually had things that one would do that the other wouldn't do that could make it a better experience. So some people say, make it the same. Other people feel that, no, the, the version I do for PlayStation is gonna use everything that PlayStation offers. Mark? Well, you know, it's funny that I was thinking when you were talking about that about, um, as I mentioned, when I was, uh, you know, recently at Revolve Agency and we had created these, yeah, you, we had gone into one of the movie studios and had done some work for them and created an AR experience that was very simple uh, for the movie Dunkirk that involved using, we had to do it very quickly so we licensed the, or we got the studio to license the Blipar app. And um, essentially, that meant that as long as you downloaded Blipar, which you had some instruction to do with the uh, piece of paper that was printed with the with the what triggered the AR experience, uh, you would um, you would be able to, to do this. But of course, it becomes you know a huge gating factor to people. Uh, you know, it's an extra. It's even more than a click. You actually have to wait and download, and hopefully, you have good bandwidth, and it goes quickly, and then then you can activate the experience after that. So we go into the, the studio again, and we talk to them about what they wanted, and they said, well, we want an AR or a VR experience that doesn't require any, any download. And um, this is just, just prior to ARKid and, and um, you know, those capabilities on, on Android as well. Um, and so what we do is we developed our own technology first for a 360 VR experience that requires no download at all. And then one for AR. And the AR one, I don't think it's been deployed just yet. But essentially, you could, for example, if, uh, let's say you had a superhero movie coming out and you wanted to be able to have your face, half of your face turn into the mask of that character, something like that. That's something that we were uh, at least on the brink of being able to fully do. We were, I, you know, the alpha test was working and it was, it was working really well. But it's not a high fidelity experience. It's not the type of experience I think that, that you know anyone up here is really involved with. Um, what the advantage of it is, it can get to everybody. 
and you don't need special equipment and you don't need a special install. Obviously, you're downloading some data, but just like everything else that we do with our phones now, that's transparent to us, especially the faster phones we get, the newer phones we get, and the, you know, moving to 5G networks now. Um, and I think that that's a really valid use of, of AR or any MR type technology. Um, you just have to accept the fact that at least in the near term, it's just not going to be, you know, the detail is not going to be what you're going to get if you have a PlayStation. So we're, let's go ahead. I was going to ask that. I'm, I've been, uh, I work in a space that involves more of a deep funnel. So we're talking about a lot of like high level mind share experiential. I was wondering if anybody had. Elaborate. Would you give an example? Like, yeah, I was going to say, I wonder if anybody had any experience like around point of sale. Um, I work in the retail fashion industry. Mm. And we have a lot. My company has a lot of stores. Like a lot. And uh, so I came here kind of looking. Our company is looking to do a deeper integration. I, mean, I run the mobile app team globally. And our company Which company is that? Guest Jeans. Oh, cool. And so we, our company is looking to do, uh, our mobile app team has specifically been tasked with leaving the e-com platform behind. Like our, you know, social is crushing it. We've got YouTube. We've got all these things to drive e-com users to the platform to buy things online. So, you know, our CIO is like, go find another set, fresh set of users and double the revenue of the e-com platform by essentially fishing in the stores. And so the next two years of my life, we're going to be doing that. And now we're looking at cost over, hence the reason I'm here. So the question is like, have you have you guys seen anything, done anything? You know, I'm sure of Antonio. Right? That's why I'm like, I'm be over. Right. No. Yeah. Well, it's like I I love this problem because, for example, most of the people that probably walk through your store doors don't ever make it to the cash register. So what we've and we've seen that pattern and that and I mentioned the goldfish because it's very true, and I'm sure there's other things like coming at you whether you guys have other displays and whatnot. Um, and so because they don't make it to the cash register, you're never going to capture that data. But if now you put in an experience, whether it's through one of your influencers that you could, has could be nothing to do with shopping. It really could just be, you know, let's say there's an influencer and you can do a selfie with some influencer or you could play if you're focused on some type of shopping experience of like, you know, what color suits you best and you do kind of like a BuzzFeed type interactive experience. Yeah. You now have their name and email their gender, sentiment, age range. So I know between the, eight, the hours of 10 a.m. and 12 p.m., 30% of the store people that came in were female between the ages of 30 and 35, you know, and they preferred, you know, the spring line over the fall line or, so, you know, some, some experience like that. Yeah. Where now you're collecting all this data and now you can go back, but now you can follow up. So that person came in, come back in, buy online for 20% off this, or you have 24 hours to do that. Have you seen anything that specifically pushes, you know, users so we can integrate it with like for example where you could then purchase that like immediately online whether it goes so after you do the experience you get an email that you could either share it or you could do an immediate purchase we could even have it where if they're sent a code they have to come in store and you can scan it and we can integrate whatever existing experience you have into it um, or if you do the experience and buy today you might get a discount or you might be able to be entered into a promotion it really depends on kind of like what that is if you have any promotions but what we've noticed too is the customization so you could show endless amount of inventory currently we work with the jewelry line um, and there's you know over 250 rings that they can zoom in zoom out touch experience and we're collecting the data of how people are responding to those rings and then they're able to also customize those rings as well and they can then order it where most of the time you think jewelry people they want to touch it but you know they don't have all of those inventory in store um, so for our clothing what we've done you know we've done stuff with Adidas and Nike in store and they were launching a new shoe and so the experience was there's a holographic shoe just to catch people's attention and you got to do, you do this like fun dance but if they did that experience had nothing to do with a product just the screensaver they then got a promotional email afterwards you know to purchase on that day so it just really we would work with our clients yourself like understanding your customer journey and where they're coming from where we can capture them and we'd create an experience to meet those goals yeah that's that's kind of my question for the whole panel is like examples of I mean, of course, I can't go immediately really to conference. Right. So I'm not like, oh, why is that? But <laughs> have you play, have, has anybody had any hands-on experience with the Alexa look? I have got to order one of those. Actually, it's not my Because, I mean, it, it's intriguing and it's creepy. I mean, it's the, I have, 
in my office at home, I have uh, four Alexas. And so I have to turn them off when I'm on a phone call only because I'll go, well, I'll check that on my computer. And the one I call computer goes, yes. So they're, you know, and I went, wait a minute, there's an echo on the line. Yes. I'm like, so I have to put them all on mute. I wanted to get a look because who's not familiar with the look? Uh, everybody, okay. The look is a thing that will uh, 3D map clothing on you. So you stand in front of it, and it says, "Try these jeans on. Try this blouse on. Try this suit on." But you start out in your underwear, and I think most people are scared. There's a guy in Seattle, you know, the same guy that that hacked the Russian, ele you know, that hacked the election, living with his mother in the basement. <laughs> who's watching the video? Who's watching the video? But the idea of being able to stand there and basically be a paper doll and getting dressed has some potential, especially if you refine it and you yes. say yes. these jeans would be good for you based on your body shape. We're not going to try and get you into either something that's too thin or too. And that's that's actually a really good point because the directive from our CEO is to extend the store experience out into the digital right and feel, into the medium. So right. It's not like I'm looking to necessarily put a display in store, Lord knows I'm not a store display person. It's more like, how can I take a user that like touches the store, has some kind of physical, even as near one, right. and then reach reach out with these technologies into their world, like, you know. I mean, Alexa, that, that device might be something that you could create, you know, a sub app for that totally. could be really interesting. On the other hand, I was in, I, I spoke at a um, AR, uh, mixed reality in New Zealand last year. And Air New Zealand had an app created for them where the flight attendant would wear a HoloLens and stand over you and go, hello, Mr. Netter, would you like your, and there was, I love, you'd have to see my house, I love gadgets. This creeped the shit out of me. Because the same thing could be done with an iPad. Yeah. And it's not where, because they showed the guy standing, I mean, the guy was there, he tried it on, and it would say, you know, how many flights you'd had, what what meal you ordered on the last flight, yeah. you know, if the woman sitting next to you was really your wife. <laughs> but it was, and it just, and I had to do a panel with the guy from Air New Zealand, and I, and he was a sponsor of the conference, and they didn't invite me back this year. But I asked him, <laughs> don't you think that goes a little too far? Because, yeah, there's a gee whiz that you can show your CEO, we're doing the newest, coolest thing. Meanwhile, everyone who tried it was completely creeped out by it. Yeah. So sometimes it's not, certain mediums are not the right medium. And that's what I think has slowed down this Alexa look. Yeah. Because there have yeah. been stories of voice being captured. Yeah, even though it does stuff that our customers say are very valuable, like it does, Alexa look not only does like put it on your body type AR stuff, but it'll also do what's called closet styling. Right. So you can show it every piece of clothing in your closet. Right. And then it'll, it, it it'll make recommendations. Like, what goes with this handbag and then things like, Boom, and instantly searches, you know, all of Amazon's partners, which we are on. Right. And I'll be like, you know, you should get this bandage dress. From right. Here. But if you narrowed it down to a guest experience as opposed to an Alexa Amazon experience, it could be cool. Yeah, have you seen uh, <laughs> this new, uh, anybody have this new Note 9? The, the new Note 9? No, I've got a Galaxy it's a, 9 Plus. <laughs> it's, 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 they have this thing called the Bixby technology. It's phenomenal. Oh, Bixby, yeah, I've got Bixby. Yeah, yeah the Bixby is really great. Bixby's so great. I was thinking for you, so what Bixby could do is there's no additional app you download. Once you start the camera, Bixby gives you all these categories like makeup. And if you clicked on makeup, makeup kind of like Snapchat, it'll right. do a really, you could start like doing a makeover of your face, uh, d depending on who wants to do that, right? <laughs> right. But if you, as you keep going down the list, it has a food icon. And then I've been testing the heck out of this thing. It like scan lasagna, how many calories is in it. It just like picks up whatever food you have around. Oh it does it for wine. You put a wine bottle there. You don't have to download Vivino or any apps. The default camera, you just turn it on and scans it. So they, it's an enhanced Google goggles. It is, and they just, they just added Amazon to it. Right. It's crazy, so you could just walk around the conference and just scan anything and it'll recognize it and let you buy it, You know, take you right to the store. but. A fashion one could be really cool because it, it picks up like jeans. Have you taken a picture of yourself with the Bixby? Um, a, so the, the, uh, the emojis and all that? You know, like the vendor, so the way they're achieving this is by plugging in like 200 middleman third party vendors. And those vendors are turning around and selling us uh, placement in that, mm. in that response. 
So oh, in the, in the big speed? Like, cool, look at my lasagna. It's like, yeah, the Stouffer's 50% off down the street. <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 Yes. Tying in multiple third party vendors, sure. Stouffer's like throwing down the money to cover that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we've been probably <laughs> well, one, kind of is. I just think for so anybody to be able to. One thing you should still think about, which I think like, based on what you just said, first you had mentioned retail, so I was kind of talking about the in store, is there's, you said, a huge percentage of people that gas is not attracting into the store. You don't know what they're shopping, right? <laughs> or you said jeans. Are jeans. You know <laughs> I've been a fan of gas since I was. Uh, a young girl but my point being is it's about the experience you're giving that customer and it's not that blatant in your face advertising exactly. there's that three touch points that you know before you purchase something your friend might have said oh my god I saw these amazing jeans and you see an advertisement then you read something or you something pops up in your Facebook feed or something um, just randomly uh, no but so those randomly. three, those three <laughs> touch points that touch you it's you're giving them this experience and it might be just some fun experience that's not in store can be placed elsewhere before they know it that experience was brought to them by guests someone they might have not have thought of immediately or might not have you know shop there in a bit or whatnot so I think with that it comes down to knowing that target you're going after create an experience that's going to reach them and then finding out ways where we can we place these experiences and to attract them and so it's kind of like you know a few things that go into it that we spend I mean I spend a lot of time people usually come to me like we need a hologram like of what I don't know we just need a hologram yeah. and right. I'm like well <laughs> so I think it's kind of go diving deeper and sure? then coming up with an experience that way yeah I'm looking for examples for anything if anybody has one doesn't have to be right now but are you yeah. trying to get more people into the stores no no he's saying no. extend the store into the individual the, realm, yeah. into right. the digital realm I'm actually in a high level uh, yeah. That's a, no, this is all good. That's the, that's the thing. Is like I'm looking for, specifically, I was looking for examples of like, oh, yeah. You know, we did, like you said, we were working with a jeweler. And it's like, oh, yeah, we were working with, you know, Blue Nile. And, right. you know, they don't have all their inventory on the floor. So then we have this, you know, there's ring, 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 ring. And then this last ring in the box looks like a ring, but it's actually, like, swipeable. And you can switch out, like, a hundred different ones. Something like right. that. Where it's like, I mean, Amazon yeah. has an AR experience. I, I was looking. You know, my girl. Uh, we can call Maggie and talk to her. <laughs> she like we have four Roombas in the house now. They bump into each other. It's it's like battle bots. And she wanted the new one, and she was bugging me. So I sent her a picture that I got her the new one. It wasn't the new one. I used the AR function in Amazon shopping, and I put the Roomba in the living room on the floor. It really wasn't there. But there's a drop shadow. It looks. And it looks around the room. You scan the phone around the room, and it sizes the Roomba, so it's not this big. You know, you know, it basically looked like it was there. And then I sent her a picture without it sitting there, and she went, "Oh, she didn't get it. I mean, she I didn't get it for her." Has anybody seen a slam dunk? Like I've heard a virtual showroom, like IKEA, like put this couch in the middle of your empty floor, and, like it's going to be so beautiful, you'll have to buy it. Right. The IKEA thing is really good. Amazon does it. There's some good ones. Who in the audience has had a his played was AR branded AR apps who's had a good experience that they want to mention or what's the worst one you've seen I can't ask them what's the worst thing you've ever seen because they won't say it because it could be a client <laughs> <laughs> and fixer isn't here today yes Gary what's the best thing you've seen and the worst thing you've seen in AR, in AR. Uh, I hate to keep mentioning ODG, but you guys will all think I work for them and I do not were they in, was he in Wu-Tang no <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, Mr. Berger.
Mary's sitting on it too, is to bring people into your store. I think the shopping at home will result in lots of returns. <laughs> so you get a AI ML that's really, really good, and it's reading the person, not just their body. I'm saying this is a joke, but seriously, if you're trying to get people into retail, if you want to double or triple triple your dwell time with a couple coming in for the boyfriend to say, yes, she looks good in that or whatever, to do what, what Mr. Berger is saying, put a couple boyfriend chairs in the store. <laughs> I walk out of stores all the time because it's like I'm standing there going, I'll be next door at the uh, whatever. Because all it takes is a couple chairs and the boyfriend. I'll sit there and check email for hours. but And I'll sit there and go, you look great. Come back. Go, go change something else. But literally the number of stores and I you know, whether it's uh, Zara or whatever, you know, I'll sit on a display and they'll go, I'm sorry, sir, you're not allowed to sit by the mannequin. Mm -hmm. It's the only. I actually tested out the chairs for her new store. What? I tested the chairs out for her new store. But I'm sorry, Really? I will spend a half an hour to an hour in a store if there's a chair. If not, I'm just going to stand there and go, whatever. But you want that experience to be good. Gary, you had something else? Yeah, I'll shut up. Okay. The, uh, Warby Parker. Warby, Warby Parker. Parker. Yeah, they send you the glasses in the mail. I mean, their, their uh, virtual platform was really good. You know, where you can virtually try out all their glasses. It was really good. You could build your face type and all that. When they started sending you five glasses right. to find at home, they more than doubled sales. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I bought two pair. The technology was great. It's just the experience was something that people wanted uh, tactile versions. Right. Anybody else want to testify about something they liked? Or, yeah. Yes, sir, Mr. Uh, Tyler, is it? Yes. yes. Um, <laughs> Daiquiri has amazing apps for bands, cars, I've seen pretty decent stuff. I mean, at least it was like three or four years ago. It was all like that. Yeah. They're, and they're still surviving. Yeah. Uh, what have you what have you guys seen that you wish you did? Who's done something you go, wow, that was cool. Wish we had thought of that. Or something you've done that you're very proud of. What's the thing you're most proud of in AR right now? The stuff you did for Magic Leap last week? Um, yeah, but I think yeah. what I was thinking. But that was last week. <laughs> no, no, I was just thinking. Uh, I remember in VR when I first saw uh, the blue with the whale coming in. Right. That was like four years ago. I was right. Like, it's kind of blown well, away. Or tilt brush, right? That's right. what I always brought my, hey, try this. It's really cool. But I think in AR, something I thought was really cool was a demo in AR kit. Um, and it was that AHA video, that Take On Me video. I think some of you guys may have saw that right. on YouTube. But um, what, what really resonated with us is we looked at it, and then I had three engineers right away. Uh, so me and another creative designer were like, wow, that's so cool. Portals in AR, and you could walk through them. And you turn around right. and it's there. And then we started researching. So it's one guy did it in like a month, just got AR kit. I was like, wow, I wonder what we could do. So we started planning things out. And, I, and our engineers came in and said, that's pretty cool. We could probably do it in about four hours. Right. <laughs> and they, told, they said, you use this filter, you do this. And so we were just kind of like blown away, like AR kit. We're, let's go all in. And, in this, and that, that's like two years before we started doing the Magic Leap stuff. But for us, that was one demo where we felt like that was pretty amazing. And then we just you know, figured it out. What I think was pretty amazing is to also think this uh, in London, bus stop, this Pepsi right. advertisement. That was great. But what I'm proud of is our sideboard camera because with, uh, with Snapchat, you're looking mirror, like mirror. With Facebook, you go outside, but we put the camera beside, so the people actually can forget the camera right. and be middle of the story, be part of this experience. And when it's sorted, you can share it to your friends. Right. Very and that's cool. that's our business idea. Natasha, you've done a bunch of stuff. What what are you most proud of? Most proud but of I know you're equally proud of Adidas and Nike. We'll solve you that. No, right one there. thing I think what we've been really well. First of all, I'm just excited that people are talking more about. AR and developing content and it's like here and it's 
you know, we spent six years educating a lot of people, and it's great to see these different ideas, these new use cases. Um, one thing I think I'm really excited about what we built was we uh, were we were able to take a chat bot and as I mentioned our AI hologram and take any chat bot web base heck base and then add a face to that and it becomes you know your AI you know we've done it for training in the healthcare facilities so you have like a doctor and he uh, you can ask him questions he answers back um, you know, we can do that in the retail space. We do that a lot for events, for concierges. And the cool thing is it's using existing platforms. So it's not having to complete. We can create it too, but if you have this content you want to use in a different medium, we built that middleware to be able to do that. And I think that's what's exciting for us is we've, that's allowed us to work with a lot more brands and then literally bring Alexa to life or bring and seeing people react to those type of holograms has been really exciting for me. Very cool. I'd say the coolest thing that, um, that one of the things that really kind of blew me away when I was first exposed to AR kit was a company that and I think they've deployed this since now. It's a whole storyboarding uh, technology inside of AR kit where you can essentially set characters in a room. You can pick any angle in the room, you can move it around. So let's say you're directing a commercial tomorrow morning and you wanted the DP wasn't able to come to the scout and you want to tell them what shots you want. You can literally spatially recognize everything in the room and you can place characters anywhere you want. You can create moving shots, static shots, all kinds of things. And Very cool. export it. And share Very it. Cool. It's funny, we did this panel a year and a half ago. I asked one of the panelists, I said, what's the hardest assignment you've had? And they said, uh, we have a client that wants to do an AR experience without a download. And I asked, did you suggest using Molly? <laughs> we don't need to do that anymore. Uh, Helps. That AR, the, the, the built-in tools now, I mean, the Bixby stuff you were talking about, Anthony, or what you're talking about with AR kit, it is making it much more um, uh, universal right now that people can at least noodle with this and, and experiment and learn. So it's not, it's not as precious as it was a couple of years ago. So who out there? Yes, sir. I saw a compelling it's down video. the hall. I'm sorry, no. I saw a compelling video of a bus stop AR application where people are sitting at a bus stop and there's a screen on one side of the bus stop. I was going to say. Oh, yeah. Yes, was, that's, that's, that's the one this. I'm talking about. Yeah, so that's, that's the one. It's yeah. where the monster it's comes up one. out of the sewer and yeah. like pulls people yeah. in. Yeah. Yeah. And that was, who, who sponsored that? Or what Pepsi. 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 It was brilliant. It's brilliant. And because it's such a shock and it's in the real world and you're like, and basically what it is is essentially the the, the bus stop bulletin, I guess you would call it, is uh, just a TV screen on its side. And so there's an AR camera, there's a camera on the other camera side. Camera on the other side, and yeah. And they're, they're randomly throwing this thing in there. And, it's and crazy. It's crazy. I've also seen a really interesting one for film which is now being used as kind of a green screen replacement where um, it's called AR screen and they basically they're out of Culver City and it's basically a huge screen you have some sort of 3D model or environment inside of that and you can shoot with a camera that is technically technologically locked to the screen right. yeah, but they have a tracker on the camera yeah. and so it changes the perspective of the screen through it's running off real yeah, so essentially it's, it's similar to some degrees to what they did with the movie Gravity and how they made that, right. but sort of more to scale, I think, and it's kind of mind-blowing. Yeah, they also have a sensor that senses the light so that it changes the light in the background based upon the light in, in the room. It's pretty remarkable. I yes. saw it before they had that in, but yeah, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> Billy? Yeah, and I think one of the things that's interesting about, and you know, uh, probably folks on the panel here can speak to this even more. You know, AR is not just, and these these success with these technologies is not just one technology. It's not just like, oh, we can put an image on top of something on your phone. It's spatial recognition, spatial mapping. 
it's bringing together all these things that we can now compute at faster speeds than like ever imagined before in history that that make these things work. I think that's why AR in some ways maybe is more exciting than VR because you really do you bring in you bring in sound, you bring in all of these other technologies that now you can process at these crazy speeds. I mean the different I, I think somebody I, can't, I don't know if I have the exact dates here, but the difference between like prehistoric times and like 19 let's say you know 98 is you know the difference between 1998 and now is gr technologically is greater than the difference between like you know right. cavemen and you know the, the the first AOL disc that went out <laughs> like we've seen such incredible growth in our in our time and you know you think about it like it's you know we think oh, science fiction is what happens 50 years from now 100 years from now 200 years from now if you look at what how much our technological society has changed in the past let's call it since 2000 the past 15 years you know there was no facebook 15 years ago there was no social media you know all these changes i mean looking ahead 10 years from now what's going to be possible and not necessarily costing 20 billion dollars to do well, what's interesting about it is, over the years, watching the, the time lag shrink between showing somebody something amazing and having them sit there and go, wow, and then there's a long pause. It used to be. Now it's a very short pause. Yeah, but will it do this? Yeah, exactly. The acceptance of, oh my god, that's amazing. Okay, cool, I got it. Can it do this? No, it'll do it in soon. Yeah, but why won't it do it now? 20 seconds ago, you were blown away that it did this. And now you've accepted, yeah, yeah, but you showed it could be done. So, is so any, there is this sense of entitlement now in terms of tech should do. You know, when we complain about cell phone calls, I don't know if anybody actually really knows everything that's going on behind a phone call. And yet we sit there going, damn, call dropped. <laughs> you know. I mean, I can literally track my son at college in Chicago every minute of the day. And I know when he gets home at 5 in the morning. And I try not to tell him that I know he got home at 5 in the morning so he doesn't turn off Life 360. But, I mean, it's kind of mind-blowing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering, does anyone know anything about, like, AR contact lenses? Because I think that's, like, the future. Yeah. <laughs> Tyler? Where's the battery go? All right. <laughs> ah. Loud. Daiquiri, my personal opinion, Daiquiri was 1.0, and it was very temperamental and very expensive. It's a lot easier and a lot cheaper and a lot more user-friendly now. And I don't know how much progress Daiquiri has made since we all saw it four years ago. But Maybe it's come long. I haven't seen anything from Daiquiri in three years. It was very temperamental when I first used it. I would say on our, um, I think it definitely has become more affordable, and the reason why is we're automating and other companies, you know, things. So we're not having to develop every single thing from scratch. And there's specifications that you can use. And now there's multiple displays as well that you can use or headsets or whatnot. So definitely I would relook at different um, things you're looking at three years ago because as technology also advances, you know, the companies, firmware and software, my, ourselves and everyone else, I'm sure, you know, is able to use that new technology and also find new ways to make it more scalable. Other questions, comments? Yes, ma'am. This may be just off the wall, but I'm, I'm curious. I mean, this what we love. This AR, do you, does anybody see a different use for audio? I mean, well, it has to be, it has to be spatial. It has to be audio that, if I hear a gunshot over here, I need to be able to hear, turn my head and hear, hear the next gunshot here. Not, I, mean, I can't be chasing. So there is a lot of audio now where this was hard to do even three years ago. It's not become trivial, but where you're hearing something behind you and you turn around, the sound now has to be in front of you. And they can do it with a sound bar, right. not with headphones. Right. They can play special right. audio just with the right. speakers that are in the also, I was going to say, I've been doing a lot of studying on voice UI. Yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. And I was watching the Magic Leap demo with the ping pong guys. Right. Like playing ping pong, and you have to like do this weird like thing to get the ball to spawn a new ball. And I was like, oh, that'll be voice. Like voice UI mixed with um, AR is going to be critical. So that way you're just like ball, and it like appears in your hand, not yeah. you know, like 
some weird, he had this weird gesture to kick a ball this morning. I was like, I can tell voice UI mixing with AR is going to be like a big deal. Mm -hmm. get that smooth, you know, like, I mean, we. Says to me and the wall blows away. Who has the Alexa TV cube? Anybody? Okay, so I've got an Alexa Cube, and you can go Alexa TV on, Alexa Play Netflix. There is a tendency to sit there, net, play uh, Maniac. No, not that episode. The uh, you have a remote in front of you. It's so, and I literally, I, I, again, hi darling, I didn't mean it. I'll say, Maggie, pick up the effing remote. No, you know, Alexa, play Netflix episode four, whatever. And now we're watching that girl with Marlo Thomas, which is not what we wanted. So, <laughs> you know, it's here, it's coming, it's there, but it, it, it doesn't do everything you want yet. And, you know, you've all seen the outtakes of bad Alexa experiences. You know. With audio too, so one example I can give you is with um, our artificial intelligence hologram. We have actually used live actors for voice um, for a lot of the experiences because using a lot of the existing is very robotic and people don't respond. As we also recommend that our clients add like a more human, like a, like a joke or like everyone always goes up to them like, or, is this the end of the world? Or like really funny questions. So we add, it's like, it's almost like you walk into something you've never seen it before. So you want to add that personality to make that person feel comfortable. And a part of that is voice, like a huge part of that is. And so we will like, you know, walk through and interview people and, you know, making sure because it was too robotic for some of the stuff. But if it's like an elf, then we could probably be more robotic. But if it's a human that you want to walk and say, I have a meeting with Michael at 10, you probably want something with a more calming voice where with our, with our, um, interaction with facial recognition, if someone comes up really distraught, our hologram can respond more commonly and say, how can I help you? And so we're, the voice is really a huge part of all of those experiences for us. You know, even that frosted glass uh, 3M thing where you have the <coughs> virtual assistant in a convention center, you know what I'm talking about? It's a cutout, it's a cutout piece of glass <coughs> with rear projection with a person saying, hi, can I help you? Oh, it's down low. It's spooky the first time you see it. We have five minutes left. Any question? You got a bunch of really smart people up here. Um, anything else you want to ask them or any comments on what's going on? Yes, sir. Loud. I think in Grand Central Station it'd be cool. I think on the train platform I'd be nervous. No, what? Like the subway, uh, <laughs> subway plat? Yeah, but you want to make sure that you know where the edge is. I'm not being fun. Seriously. You could. What's who's going to fund it yeah. <laughs> is usually, so that's where it goes to the advertising side, it's usually the brand, but you, you do need, we've been approached by an advertising agency to do that in this, but it's one, the space that you have, it's not there also protecting it um, from, you know, things uh, as well as, you know, the approval of building something new and the infrastructure of it, and then you look at the scalability of it. Um, it's definitely doable. It's just um, usually that's going to be sponsored by a brand uh, to implement that. Or, or the Annenbergs. We, we did a, um, a uh, kiosk in a public space for a shoe company. And uh, the vision, and it was a 30-day uh, installation. And what you would do is there was a new shoe that was coming out. And then when you bring your phone up to it, there was like five pictures that had like a trigger embed a you know some kind of trigger inside of each photo and then you kind of watch the creation of the shoe like it all comes apart and you can see oh, then it, it evolved like it was five stages and the fifth one was an actual athlete like a video like a little hologram coming up and running and it, uh, it had a ton of traffic it was constantly like people hey you got to check this out and they download this app and kind of go through it uh, but it worked though in terms of from a funding perspective there was enough budget to do something that had enough content for like a 30-day period 
So anywhere from you know a hundred to like three hundred k is typically what a budget like something like that would be. And how was customer acquisition? But you're welcome or to lead acquisition. Yeah. Good. Um, yeah, I mean people all downloaded the app. There was a there was a QR code. A lot of people still don't know how to do the QR code thing. Uh, <laughs> but they there was the there was like three three ways to get it is is essentially what it was. But you're more than welcome to test our uh, AI video booth tomorrow. Okay. We're gonna okay. bring it here. Oh, cool. Oh, cool. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yes, sir. I was speaking to someone earlier about the idea of an AR cloud, and I was wondering, in some of your context, have you run into kind of this legal issue of property in the AR, AR space? For example, two or more companies that want to use a geotag location for their own promotion? Oh, that's a good <laughs> Great question. Yeah, I think there's information sure. online right now you jump with, in, with like Niantic, uh, with all the Pokemon Go stuff. I think there's been some recent issues about that. We had a company that said, hey, we want you to put this here at this Starbucks. And we weren't sure if we could do that or not. Did you do yeah. it for their advertising? Keith, why don't you take 30 seconds to explain what you do? Yeah, because it falls into that. It, it's a natural fit. around the earth and uh, we can make find your friends we can spawn up content uh, we think more utility typing map content and also there's an advertising channel behind it uh, we're six years in three patents in that space that device to device connectivity so we've thought about it a lot um, there is no there's some legislation that's being you know poked around to deal with the, the question of whether it's uh, you know um, who owns that right, but really no, no no one owns that space just yet. It's whatever device or platform that you're on, you vis you know, you're gonna be able to make it visible. Uh, Trump Trump's Space Force will deal with who owns that space. That's what the Space Force is for. You know, it's funny, that makes me you know wonder, has anyone seen any really cool as it gorilla art type projects, no permit, you know, just interesting AR type, because you know, I think about when you talk about that, about how people project things on the Trump hotel in right. in uh, in DC a, as a form of protest. And I'm just wondering, you, did you say you had seen something like that? We used to do that in Manhattan, um, uh, like right around when the, uh, the, the protest happened, started happening in Washington. We right. like, used that as an opportunity to kind of start projecting on walls, and we had a place in 39 Third, so we would do it from our rooftop. <laughs> right, but, uh, but that what wasn't an AR, oh, right. but an AR, experience, in an AR experience where you basically. Uh, so we have, we had not many times that kind of project in Finland. Yeah, yeah, we had done it. Well, you have to, you have to do it in slush. Finland. There's nothing else to do there. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of what kind of protest was it? Like using public spaces uh, to share art made, made by university students. Yeah, would it be like an AR thing where yeah. you could yeah. so it, you had to be in the know to kind of get it? Kind of, yeah. yeah. That sounds. Yeah. Because things like William Gibson kind of, yeah. Michael, you want to take us out? <laughs> yeah, just on, on that issue of, uh, of the, the digital rights, I sat on a panel a few months ago with a few different lawyers, and, and there is there is a debate about whether um, whether you have a virtual space that somebody has a right to. Do you, if, if, you know, does Skirball have the right to prevent you from planting something here in this room or not? Um, the answer is, is, is not yet known. I think we're gonna, there's going to be some fun litigation for the, for the uh, litigators <laughs> on this kind of thing to see, uh, to see how it plays out. But, uh, but that debate is, and discussion is being had right now. Awesome. Very cool. Did we cover everything? Is there anything we didn't cover? Are you leaving here happy? <laughs> okay, you went one last, what? It's down the hall on the left. No, okay. Right. Right. That's where the, the basically the, the law was passed, the voter suppression law, basically, which is that if you ha if you don't have an actual street address, you can't vote. And since Native Americans in North Dakota 
have a preponderance of post office. But they said they were going to give everybody virtual addresses. Is that was the the plan to fight that? Oh, that's a shock. Whoa! On that note, everybody get out and vote. Yeah. With the makeup feature on Bixby, can I make him less orange? Okay. We are over time. We're about five minutes Thank over. You. Thanks, everybody. Thank